the best way you can grow your net worth is to grow your network. I know it's kind of trite, but you should be having lunch or coffee with someone every single day with a broker, with a lender. If Warren Buffett came to me today and said, hey, Nick, do you want to invest in my deal? I'd say yes. Like I don't need to see a spreadsheet. It's Warren Buffett. I'm good. Right. Um, this is a this is a this is a relationship game. This is a, a qualitative game. Check your numbers, but I see a lot of people driving their investment decisions from a spreadsheet, and that that can get you into a dangerous place. Welcome to the How to Scale Commercial Real Estate Show. Whether you are an active or passive investor, we'll teach you how to scale your real estate investing business into something big. Nick Stockerberg is an active real estate investor and owner of Black Swan Real Estate. He wholly owns over $25 million of real estate assets and manages over $100 million in assets under manage of management of both single family homes and large multifamily communities with investment partners. Soon they will be launching their private equity fund in Q1 2022. He's also a licensed real estate agent in Minnesota, and he lives in Rochester, Minnesota with his wife, Elaine, who is a full-time partner in their, in their investments and businesses and has three amazing children. Nick, welcome to the show. Thanks. It's a pleasure to be here. Hey, man, the pleasure's mine. You know, the same three questions I ask every guest who comes on the show. Can you quickly tell us where did you start? Where are you now? And how did you get there? Yeah, so uh, I started the way I think a lot of people start uh, doing a, a sweat equity, um, you know, remodel, uh, kind of a you know a bigger pockets vision of wealth or whatever. I think as a, as a lot of people see it, and uh, you know, spooled up to about uh, twenty of those uh, over the course of many years, just kind of picking up you know a few properties a year or whatever, and finally got to uh, to retirement, and then. Um, I don't know if you've ever been to like a Tony Robbins event, but uh, just so happened, I, I think my path is guided, but I, uh, I got a free ticket to this Tony Robbins event with my wife that just happened to be the day after I, I quit my day job after 15 years in IT. I was thinking, okay, I'm retired. I'm, you know, I'm just going to take it easy for a while. I've got my 80K a year and in passive income. I'm, I'm set for life and mm -hmm. uh, you know, not sure what I'm going to do. And, and uh, if you go to one of those events, Tony gets you jacked up and uh, you know, he says, if you're not sure what to do with the steering wheel, just put the pedal to the metal and you'll figure it out real fast. He might say it a little more colorfully than that. And uh, and then he'll also challenge you and say, hey, uh, you know, is your business as successful as you want it to be? And, you know, everyone there, of course, says no. And he says, it's because you're not listening to your customer. And uh, I was like, well, um, you know, I actually had to make up this metaphor for turning away business. Everyone would come to me all the time and say, hey, Nick, um, can you create for me the thing that you've created? You've got all these properties and passive income. Can you you know, buy properties for me and manage them. And I actually had to make up a script to streamline turning away business. And I'd say, oh, no, no, no. I, I love raising my own kids, but I don't want to open a daycare. And, uh, you know, Tony will challenge you and say, you know, you, you tell yourself, oh, I don't want to do that. But you should be asking yourself, who can I hire to do that? Or how can I do that? Or how can I serve these people? So, uh, you know, I left that event and said, I want to, you know, 10x, 100x or whatever. And so, uh, you know, we had, uh, let's say less than 5 million assets then, you know, two and a half years ago and we have over a hundred million assets today and uh, uh, just by serving people just kind of leaning into that you know those operative questions um, and so today we've uh, you know we buy a lot of single-family homes uh, you know we've got our, our course single family at scale I think that you can do single family at scale if you have really really good systems and processes and you do it all identically uh, you can use a lot of the same stuff you do in multifamily in single-family homes and then we do uh, you know we'll buy uh, 10 10 apartment deals this year. So uh, that's kind of where we're at today. And we're doing a, a $40 million ground up construction project of a, a townhome community too. So that's, that's been not profitable. We'll say it's not, it's not anti-profitable, but uh, it's a lot of fun. It's, it's a lot of fun to go out there and see bulldozers pushing dirt around and slabs going in the ground and stuff. I feel like uh, every kid at a, at a playground with one of those little uh, bulldozer or uh, excavators with the handles, but on mm -hmm. a, on a bigger scale. Right. You got your Tonka trucks out there having, yeah. having a good time, man. Yeah. That's a, that's a lot of growth in a very short period of time, you know, two and a half years. That's, yeah. uh, that's, that's a lot of uh, moving pieces there. And, you know, let's tackle one. There's a common myth that single family cannot be done at scale. Yeah. Can you, can you dispel that myth for us? Absolutely. You know, most people just don't approach it with a really systematized kind of process. So um, we have a, a pipeline that things go through. So I, I have a tech background and 
We use all the same kind of systems and processes and tools. So we use like a Trello, for example, to manage all of our renovations. People say, oh, you can't manage more than 10 residential remodels and stay sane. Well, we just have a, a Trello board. You go to check out Trello and each, you know, each uh, job site is like a card on that Trello board. We've got a Google Doc for a scope of work. There's not a single piece of paper or phone call in that whole pipeline. Um, we use the same light fixture, the same paint color, the same everything in every single one of our remodels. All of our contractors know exactly what SKUs to use. So we never have to say, oh yeah, in this one, we're going to do this. I mean, there's a, there's a tiny bit of, you know, differences, but, um, you know, we use the same uh, kind of financing pipeline. We have the same, you know, management for everything. We have the same uh, policies and procedures and, um, you know, every, like we have the same fencing contractor install the exact same fence in every single one of our properties. So there's just not a lot of, you um, there's just not a lot of touch to it. And the truth is that single family runs a much lower expense ratio than multifamily because you uh, aren't paying for utilities. In our area in Minnesota, snow removal is a big deal. Well, the you know the resident manages snow removal and lawn care, and they also tend to be lower maintenance in a way if you find the right residents, um, just less needy tenants. So our single family actually runs a lower expense ratio than our multifamily. Uh, you just have to really nail down the management and stay sane with the management, which I think if you do it right, if you get really good systems and processes in place, um, you know, it, it, it can be done. Uh, and we feel really strongly in that. Uh, we, uh, we give away our whole playbook. Uh, we have our, our course, single family at skill.com. We give it all away for free. We think the way we do business makes the world a better place. Uh, so it's a, a pay what you want model uh, for the course. And a hundred percent of that profit goes to charity um, because we think that uh, it's not right that being a landlord or being a tenant could be a pejorative, right? Like how crazy is that? And so if you um, you know do business the way we do business, we think it uh, it will eventually maybe move the needle ever so slightly on that, on that perception. Uh, yeah. Man, that's, that's amazing. And, and I, th I think that's one of the things that, that, um, you know, people struggle with. I know, you know, that that's a common business struggle is processes. And I mean, especially on the single family side, how, how did you overcome? I mean, it's one thing, how, how do you communicate this stuff to your contractors? And then do, is it the same contract that you guys use on every single project? I guess start there. Yeah. Uh, so it's the same group of contractors. Yeah. So the same plumber and, and we've got, you know, a few different plumbers, a few different HCAC guys, a few different electricians. Uh, so it's the same kind of group of people. And anytime we onboard a new contractor uh, and you have to be pretty uh, aggressive about it on the front end. So like we refuse to write checks. So you must enroll in our uh, property management software. We yeah. run all the rehabs through our property management software for EFTs, for managing all the accounting. It's those little things like that that will make you lose your mind trying to run a whole bunch of different rehabs and a bunch of different uh, single family homes. And if you you know, can't give us a W-9 and proof of insurance and enroll in EFTs, like, I'm sorry, but we can't do business with you. Right. And maybe at first the contractor says, oh, well, you know, that's not, I, I can't, that's not worth it. Then I'll go do something else. And then, you know, a few months later they come back and, uh, and then you just take really good care of your contractors. You pay them very promptly. And we say, yeah, because we do electronic payments, you get paid, you know, 24 hours after we receive an invoice, none of this net 30, net 90 nonsense that a lot of, you know, people try to string along their contractors there and just make sure your contractors see the value proposition in your standardization. Yeah. I know that you use, you like to use this faucet. This is the faucet that goes in every single one of our properties. And if that doesn't work for you, this isn't a good fit. And there's, it's like a struggle at first. And then at some point there's kind of an aha moment. And it's kind of funny because I'll go out and like visit with our contractors every now and then I love going out to lunch with them or I'll go visit a job site and just, just, you know, give them some FaceTime. And uh, maybe at first they, uh, they really kind of push back on some of these systems and processes. And then a year later I see them, they've got the tablet that we recommend they get with the Trello board and the Google doc pulled up and I can see they're managing all of their job sites, the way we manage our job sites. And that's great. Like, please steal our, our, our secret sauce. And, uh, and our contractors will eventually say, Nick, I just make so much more money when I work with you. I don't know why, but I do. Um, and they don't even necessarily realize just how much overhead they're saving by using all those systems and processes. So it's really tough at first. Uh, and you have to say no to a lot of contractors that refuse to do, do business the way you do business. But in the long run, in my experience, they always thank you for it.
Right. And even even inside of that system, I'm sure you found a way to extricate yourself from that onboarding process. So you had to have created yes. a system for somebody else then to then onboard your I, that's the thing I love about it. It's like the building systems. It's like you build one and then you build another and then that required it, it which is, it, it's, it, it's, it's an iterative process. I'm sure. That's right. But yeah, we have a DocuSign. So literally everything we need goes into that DocuSign template and it's, it's one stop to onboard that contractor and we'll even serve them. Yep. Come on into the office. We will walk you through it shoulder to shoulder but you have to go through this process. You right. you cannot give us a piece of paper with your insurance information on it or something like that. Uh, and it's the same way with the tenants, you know, oh, you, you know, we'll take over a building. Oh, you've been paying in cash to your previous landlord for the last 30 years. I'm really sorry, but we don't accept cash. It's a safety concern. Um, you know, you, you say you don't know how to use a computer. I see you've got a, a smartphone in your hand while we're talking here. Let me go shoulder to shoulder with you, get you set up in the app and set up an automatic recurring monthly rent payment. And, uh, you know, this, no, no, I'll write you a check. I'm sorry, but we're going to have to assess you a check processing fee if we do that. And we really don't want to do that. We don't want to collect that fee and we don't want to manage the check. So we're going to really aggressively, maybe uncomfortably serve you. Maybe this is the first smartphone app you've ever used next to Facebook, but you are going to sign into the app and you are going to set up automatic recurring monthly rent payments. And I may not leave your apartment until you do. So uh, yeah, it's just all about maintaining that consistency. And that's the only way to stay sane at scale. All right. So, so here, here's, a, here's a nitty gritty question. What do you do with your tenants that don't have a bank account? Yeah. So uh, we can accept uh, pay near me. And uh, we will accept checks, uh, you know, or money order, uh, cashier's check, certified funds only, uh, you know, delivered, you know, to a secure location. Um, but we really strongly, like, we will follow up with someone monthly and just say, hey, I really appreciate you paying rent. I see you paid by a check. I am obligated. It's, it's in our process. I mean, I'm not making the person, I'm not the person making the call, but, you know, a member of our team, I'm obligated by our process to give you a call and remind you that we don't like getting checks and to remind you that you're paying a fee to, to pay with a check. How can I give you a ride to the bank? Can I, can I help you, you know, and, and people are really kind of uncomfortable with it at first. And then once they get that, you're, you know, approaching them from a, from a, a, a sincerely loving perspective and you really have their best interests in mind. Um, I mean, I could, I could give you a lot of very interesting stories, but we have had, we, we've been able to serve people in really big ways. Um, and in the end, you know, we, we come out all the better for it. We'll take over a new multi-family community and 30 checks roll in that first month we collect rent. And we're just like, oh my God, how, how did anyone do this for so long like this? And then after, you know, a couple months, maybe three checks roll in and, you know, six months later, zero checks roll in and, and it's just automated, you know, in, in instant, uh, you know, like we'll, we'll misplace a couple checks for a few thousand dollars because it's just so easy to do when you've got a whole bunch of checks rolling in. And we're just like, this is, this is unbelievable. So it's hard to do the work on the front end and, you have to be willing to have an uncomfortable conversation. And you know what, if, if it's just not a good fit, it's just not a good fit. And, uh, you know, we'll actually tell people, Hey, you know, if, if you prefer to write checks, you know, maybe we're not the landlord for you. And there are lots of great landlords out there that will accept checks. And then I find as soon as you kind of set that boundary, and this can be with a vendor, it can be with a tenant, it can be with an investor. Uh, as soon as you set that boundary, uh, I find people really appreciate it. And they're like, Oh, wow. I'm really surprised you'd, you'd go that far. I can see this is really important to you. Okay, wh what can I do to make this, you know, get rid of this friction in this relationship? And then a few months later, they'll say, gosh, you know, I can't believe I've been writing checks for rent my whole life. This is so much easier. We'll actually get that email. Well, not an email, but <laughs> we'll get that call from someone. And uh, it's, it's just so rewarding that we have drug that person into the, you know, into the 21st century kicking and screaming. Right, man. And it's amazing. Those little, little things, I call them little things, but that just yeah. occupy brain space and take yeah. up, you know, it just, it, you, you can end up having your day filled with all this little stuff that adds nothing to the bottom line or progress. That's right. And, yep. and it's, um, yeah, it's amazing when you implement small systems like that, how much that stuff stacks up and quickly. So yeah. cool. We'll, we'll do it. Go ahead. 
Oh, we'll do it in a big way too. Like we, we recently took over an 83 unit apartment building and it has an office for the, for the manager and it has an office for the maintenance manager for that building. And we just decline to staff that office. You know, we have an extraordinary level of customer service. We always answer the phone. We always respond instantly to emails and text messages that come into our property management software. If you don't use our systems for communicating, we're kind of deliberately a little less responsive to try to steer you to those systems. But um, you know, at first, people kind of freaked out a little bit that we weren't staffing the office. And then they saw that level of customer service that we were able to deliver. And you know, part of me really admires the idea that you can just like walk into the office anytime and have a half hour conversation with the building manager. And I think that that ownership is a valuable thing. But that's also just an extraordinary waste of time, uh, like an unreal waste of time. And then it makes it easier to take checks, right? Because you can go drop off a check with your building manager and suddenly a whole bunch of inefficiencies just collapse. They just disappear as soon as you take away that building manager. We still have the office. We can have a person on site in 10 minutes if there is an honest to God an emergency. We had a we had a, a false alarm, fire alarm there the other day. We had three people on site in, in 11 minutes. Um but we just declined to staff that office because we find it introduces unreal amounts of overhead and inefficiency that violate our processes. And you just, you have to be disciplined about it in order to do this at scale. Yeah, man, that's uh, that's fantastic. Hats off to you guys for developing those systems and really putting in the work up front. Cause I mean, gosh, that's, that's every entrepreneur's nightmare is yeah. getting those systems and processes done. So that's, yep. uh, that's fantastic. Tell us again your website before I forget about it, where people can download that that kind of your blueprint and pay. Yeah, pay you go to singlefamilyatscale.com and okay. we give away everything from literally the light fixture we install. It's a, a 15 inch flush mount with three 100 watt LEDs, by the way. Uh, <laughs> you you want to have replaceable LED bulbs because those LEDs do fail and we like right. that. Yeah, so we a very painful, you know, decision making and thought that's gone into each aspect of that. Everything from our, our management systems to our financing systems. We just, we give it all away there, you know, more, more or less for free. That's fantastic. We are running short on time, but there's a couple of things I really want to make sure I highlight um, because you guys aren't just doing single family. You guys, obviously you're doing, you said you're you know, buying an 83 unit property. Uh, you guys are you're closing 10, what'd you say? Multifamily deals this That's year. Right. I mean, yep. you, you guys are, are really moving, but there's one that I'd love to just hear the story on because I think it's going to have some intriguing insight you're closing a $23 million contract for deed deal. Yeah. Well, yeah, just, usually. First, first off, because we don't talk about this a lot on this show, because I, I find a lot of contract for deed stuff on the single family side. Because yeah. it's a commercial show. Talk to us. Tell us what commer- a contract for deed is, and then walk us through the deal. Yeah. So um, you're, you're right. Usually contract for deed is a single family thing. Well, we do single family and, and commercial multifamily. Um, and usually I've never heard of a contract for deed on a, a deal anywhere near that size. Mm. Uh, so it's kind of a, kind of a, a neat story, but contract for deed basically says um, that the, the seller, the, the current owner is the bank. And most commonly it's used when the buyer is, you know, has like poor credit or poor ability to buy. It can sometimes be considered like a, like a predatory instrument, but that's not, that's a misperception. And if, for example, you go out to like a agriculture land, like contract for deed land contracts are extraordinarily common. You know, farmer Jane fi- buys a farm field from farmer Joe on a, on a contract for deed. Um, so I'm, I'm sure many listeners to the podcast have encountered situations where there is a monstrous prepayment penalty on a loan. And the the owner of this building, just really bad luck. They locked in a, a swap agreement just before COVID hit. So they they locked in a really high interest rate loan relative to interest rates today. And the way swap uh, contracts work is if interest rates have gone down since you locked it, you pay a huge prepayment penalty. So this was a large loan. You know, it's a twenty three million dollar deal, and it's just it's just a really terrible luck for the seller, kind of each, you know, bad timing and everything. Um, So we said, okay, you know, we can give you this price if we make a clean purchase. And that really didn't, you know, spiritually or emotionally satisfy them. Um, And then they would, they would have to pay this huge, you know, uh, prepayment penalty in addition to that lower price. Uh, 
uh, or we can offer you a contract for deed purchase. And with that contract for deed, what we're going to do, and we've already gotten approval from the lender that we have a great relationship with, um, we're, we're going to take over your existing loan, kind of your unfavorable loan. We're going to make all the payments on that loan. Um, and then you're going to carry the balance, uh, you know, no interest, no payments, essentially uh, for up to seven years um, until that prepayment penalty wears off on your current loan. And then we'll do a refi in order to wipe out that loan, return the balance to you. Uh, and at the end of the day, it'll just be a 10% down with otherwise extraordinarily favorable financing terms when you're getting you know, no interest, no payments on even a portion of a $23 million deal for seven years. Uh, you can imagine what that does to kind of your, your rates of return. And the end outcome is, let's say interest rates bump up, you know, three years from now, some time wears off on that swap contract, that's going to reduce that prepayment penalty to zero. So probably a few years from now, uh, we're going to be able to do a little bit of value add, uh, raise rents, you know, just kind of, you know, nothing too, too exciting, but just the, the usual business plan. And we'll be able to do a cash out refi and we will never put more than 10% down on what, what is otherwise a dynasty asset, you know, a, a very pre- premium class A community in an urban core location. Um, so we might get you know, five times the typical rate of return you might otherwise get on a, on a deal of this nature. And we are making, the, the seller will get like an additional $5 million or something like that when all is said and done. So it's just a win, 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 win deal, but it just, it takes a lot of creativity to, to put it all together and, and make sure everyone understands that it's a win, win deal. How, or, or, or what is the seller? Other than, so they're getting 5 million bucks, maybe, you know, later on in the deal, are they, I mean, I guess one, why are they even selling it now? Like, why not just, why not just do what you're doing and ride it out for seven years? Yeah. So uh, why, why does anyone sell any commercial real estate? Um, and, and to be clear, the building is not publicly marketed. We have sought out, you know, buildings. We, we actually have specifically targeted this building, built a relationship with the seller. We built a, a relationship with the person who built it. They're our builder on our townhome community, made a relationship with the developer who developed this deal. This is the kind of asset where you can't, knock down buildings to build it. They had to pick up and move buildings to build this kind of asset. It's in that premium of a location. Wow. So really skilled development work to, to make that happen. So we built strategic relationships with these other parties um, in order to be able to kind of get a, a deal proposition put together for the seller. And at first the seller was like, contract for deed, isn't that you know what people do when they don't have money or they don't have credit or whatever? Like, no, this is how you can basically sell the asset at let's say a you know 2023 price today. Uh, we're going to put down you know a couple million dollars, so there's really no way you can lose here. And then we you know obviously get some very favorable financing. Uh, so they hadn't really planned on selling it, but we put together an offer that was just such a win 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 for them that uh, it, you know it's, it's it's an offer they really couldn't say no to. And there's it's been like a six month negotiation you know process on it, going from a seller who wasn't really interested in selling to like. Yeah, yeah, I guess we are kind of crazy to say no to this offer. Uh, so it's a slow process and, and the fortune is in the follow-up. I actually don't know what flipped the switch for them to sell. Mm. Um, but one day they, you know, it was kind of, they weren't very interested. We we're just keeping the dialogue going. And then all of a sudden uh, they came back, maybe there was a change in health or they want to do around the world cruise, or I don't know what they, it's a very wealthy family. They don't need the money. Um, this is just one of many businesses that they operate, a uh, very successful family. And I guess they just decided one day, Hey, if we can get this kind of money, like we're crazy to say no. Right, man. That's fantastic. I have certainly enjoyed this today, Nick. Likewise. Uh, did we miss uh, anything else? Oh, tell us quickly. Yeah, we did. We missed one thing. Your your private equity fund. Tell us maybe yeah. in a 60-second snapshot what uh, what you guys are doing with that and when, that, when that's going live. Yeah, so uh, we are unbelievably excited about that. We hope it disrupts that space in the same way we hope to kind of disrupt the, the property management space with our really unique approach to property management. Um, so it's uh, it's going to be a private equity fund that has no fees. There's no asset management fee, acquisition fee, capital event fee, disposition fee. You know, Usually you get this Wall Street persona that rounds up capital and then works with a local operator like me and they everyone's taking splits and everything. Um, and then we're going to go out and buy, uh, you know, single family and multifamily properties. It's it's structured identically to how we structured all of our other deals. There's no additional fees at that level as well. So, uh, our investors, our, our passive partners, get 100% of the profit from the deal until they get a full return of capital. And then it's a 50-50 split after that. It's a super simple. There's no 
pref or catch up pref or waterfall or all kinds of opaque fees and stuff uh, to all these different you know finance personas. Uh, you are investing in real estate. You're investing with us. You know exactly what you're getting, um, and we expect that'll fill up pretty quickly. And we're we're just unbelievably excited to kind of disrupt that private equity space in our own little way and and hopefully challenge some people's ideas. So the next time they're investing with uh, this Wall Street persona, say, hey, um, why do you need to take a two percent asset management fee, and why is there an extra twenty percent split on top of you know what what the the operators making that's actually doing the deal, um, so that's something we're we're really excited about that'll be available here in the next uh, in the next couple months. Man, that's fantastic, Nick. A few last questions for you. If you could help our listeners avoid just one mistake in real estate, what would it be, and how would you avoid it? Yeah, I see a lot of investors that have a very quantitative approach to real estate. Um, you know, I, I do calls with investors, you know, all, all the time, you just go to, to meetblackswan.com and you can just, you know, block time on my calendar and they'll frequently say, Hey, I'm looking at this deal. I've got this spreadsheet that says I'm going to get a, you know, 10% cash on cash. So it we're, we're off to the races. And then I pull up Google maps and street view. And I'm like, Oh, I can see this is not a class C property. This is really more of a class D property. And there's some garbage in the street and there's some, some, uh, you know, just, just all the warning signs there. And I'm like, yeah, this is not going to work out the way your spreadsheet says it's going to work out. This is a qualitative game. Like the best way you can grow your net worth is to grow your network. I know it's kind of trite, but you should be having lunch or coffee with someone every single day with a broker, with a lender, if Warren Buffett came to me today and said, "Hey Nick, do you want to invest in my deal?" I'd say yes. Like I don't need to see a spreadsheet. It's Warren Buffett. I'm good. Right. Um, this is a this is a this is a relationship game. This is a, a qualitative game. Check your numbers, but I see a lot of people driving their investment decisions from a spreadsheet, and that that can get you into a dangerous place. Mm, man, you said it. That's fantastic. That's fantastic, Nick. If our listeners want to get in touch with you or learn more about you, what's the best way to do that? Yeah, just go to meetblackswan.com. We've got a fun little video we recently put up there uh, that a media company did that I like. And uh, you can sign up for our newsletter, sign up for our free educational events, enroll in our course, check out our free uh, group coaching forum on Facebook. Um, we, there's just all sorts of different ways to, to connect with us. And you can just block a time on my calendar if you'd like to get in touch and see how we can serve you. Nick, thanks so much. I do appreciate your Thank time. You. Hey, thanks for listening to the How to Scale Commercial Real Estate Podcast. If you can do me a favor and subscribe and leave us a review on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, whatever platform it is you use to listen, if you can do that for us, that would be a fantastic help to the show. It helps us both attract new listeners as well as rank higher on those directories. So appreciate you listening. Thanks so much and hope to catch you on the next episode.